Hello and welcome to the Andrew Ferris Podcast. Thanks so much for joining me for another episode of the show. Today, I want to talk about the metric that I think is the most misunderstood, sometimes the most overrated, and sometimes really underrated metric in e-commerce marketing, and that is average order value. It is so obvious to people that a high AOV is good for business, but it is not so obvious to me, and I'm going to tell you why and how I think you should be thinking about AOV in your business. Let's jump in. All right, let's start with the obvious. Raising your average order value is obviously good, assuming that your average order value goes up with no cost to any of your other metrics. That is, if you can generate the same number of orders at the same margin and at the same cost on your ad spend, et cetera, as, as you were on one AOV, but with a new higher AOV, you know, if your AOV goes up 20% and everything else stays the same, it is obviously good. More dollars per customer is good. More profit per customer is good for your business. And so in that respect, AOV is unquestionably a good thing. And we should say something about D2C in particular here, which is that there is some threshold of, of AOV that you probably have to have to make the business work. Like you probably can't sell a product that is a physical product for like $5 each in D2C and have it work because of shipping costs. Unless you can charge for shipping and make money on shipping as well, it's just going to be too expensive, especially in a world where clicks might cost a dollar. Like there's just some lower limits to where AOV is, it has to be above some threshold. But one of my great contentions is that that threshold is lower than people think. That actually AOV may not be that big of an advantage. And the first reason for that, this is funny, by the way, the thing that inspired this episode was actually a, an AOV increase that was a huge win for a client. I had very little to do with it. And so I'm about to tell you why AOV is not necessarily as good as you think. But I want to also let you know that I, I'm, this is more complicated than I'm about to make it sound because... AOV has been a big advantage for a particular client of mine, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay, but first, to understand why, the first thing to notice is that when I just laid out the scenario where you get more dollars per order, I, I said that is assuming it comes at no cost to anything else. But the truth is, probably in all of life, there is a, a trade-off for almost everything that you do, and that getting a win over here might cost you something over there. And that point is the key point with average order value that people really underestimate when they talk about how AOV is good. They do not talk enough about the costs associated with that. So some of those might be really obvious, right? Like if you double your AOV, but you triple your cost of goods, it is not a win for your business in all likelihood, unless it creates a whole bunch more LTV or something like that. It has to be a win in some other area of the business for it to be worth you doing that. Another possibility for that is that if you are uh, not a pure play D2C, or if you have a huge amount of organic revenue, more AOV, even at the cost of more margin might be really good. As long as it's not coming at the cost of the number of customers you can acquire. I'll talk about that in a second. But if you have a bunch of organic revenue, it can be really, really good. But the big problem with raising AOV, and this is like the really fundamental thing, I think, is that the costs associated with raising your AOV normally are actually not margin. In fact, normally it's the opposite. And I'll, I'll walk more through that in a second. But the big problem with raising your AOV typically is that it comes at a direct cost to your conversion rate and in turn, very likely your CAC if you're using paid to generate growth in your business. So increasing your AOV may be extremely valuable for your business. And again, it depends on what your baseline AOV is and all kinds of other things. If your AOV is pretty low, it can be really, really helpful to get it up a little bit. But it's, it's just not usually for the reasons people think because... AOV and conversion rate are inversely correlated, right? The simple example of this is that like I've worked on a brand at one point that was selling, the AOV was like $3,000 or something. And it you know, was big pieces of really nice furniture. And when I worked on that brand, the AOV on a $3,000 piece of furniture is, uh, the conversion rate on a $3,000 piece of furniture is very low, right? Whereas compared to Curie deodorant, where we actually have been able to drive an AOV that's a little bit higher than you might expect in that business. And yet, for that business, this conversion rate is drastically higher. And it's for a simple reason, which is that the consideration cycle on deodorant is much shorter than the consideration cycle on a $3,000 sofa, okay? And so, so the conversion rate goes with that. So this 
behavior of conversion rate and AOV, where those where one goes up and the other goes down, is why it might not be the case that AOV is actually so good. And here's the ultimate evidence that you need, or all the evidence I need to give you, for me to tell you that you actually intuitively understand this. And it's this. If that was not true, go raise your price right now. Just go do it. Because the increase in AOV would be really good. In fact, that would be pure margin. But you know that what would happen there is there'd be a decrease in conversion rate commensurate with that. And so what most people mean when they say AOV is getting people to buy different products or add bundles or add products to a bundle or something like that. And those things can all be really, really good. But the key is, can you raise AOV without a commensurate lowering of your conversion rate and without a commensurate raising of your commensurate lowering of your margin? If you can do that, a raise in AOV can be very beneficial for your business, no question about it. But oftentimes that is much harder than it sounds. And so that's the reason why it's not so obvious to me that a higher AOV is necessarily better in a business. I'm going to give you three other reasons why that's the case. Oh, actually, before I do that, let me give you four reasons. Let's say four reasons why more AOV is not necessarily good, okay? The first is commensurate with the conversion rate issue is, or along the same lines, the conversion rate issue is the CAC issue. If you are driving lots of your growth with Facebook ads and you increase your AOV by 50%, it's pretty likely that your CAC will also go up a whole bunch as well. So you will exist the same ROAS, but a much higher CAC. And so then there's a question of the marginal efficiency of that ROAS. And that can create a real problem, actually. You can just end up spending more money on ads, acquiring the same amount of customers at the same margin, but it doesn't actually generate any additional profit for your business. Okay. So there's problem number one. Problem number two related to that is potentially, it's, and this is not always true, but it's possible that a higher AOV can also equal a lower total addressable market. Okay. And if you want evidence that a low AOV can work really, really well in an e-commerce business in surprising ways, specifically by having a very large total addressable market, just look at Simple Modern as a business. These guys have been really public about this. And so I don't think this is me talking out of turn. I've worked on this business with them. But Simple Modern runs at a pretty low AOV. It's, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't even know exactly what it is. But I mean, a water bottle from them is like 20 bucks, 18 bucks, something like that. So most people are not buying five water bottles, right? So the AOV is not very high. You can just sort of do the, the quick math in your head there. Even if people on average buy one and a half, it's pretty low. But the reason why that business can still work, well, first of all, that's why it was an Amazon business first, is that it's a, it's a price-oriented business. And you should go listen to my uh, episodes with Brian Porter about how they approached their growth on Amazon with that product in that category and with their pricing specifically. And that, that is in the show notes, of course. That's linked in the show notes. But the reason it still works on D2C is because everybody needs a water bottle. And so the low AOV can work really, really well because there are just so many people to talk to, which you can, means is essentially another way of saying that conversion rate can get really, really high because there's so many people who need a water bottle. And so you are able to generate all kinds of information. The higher your AOV, you're just going to exclude some amount of people who are financially unable to buy your products because the AOV has gone up because it's more and more of a luxury good or something like that. Now, that does not mean that you can't build a very big and very good business that way, right? Just talk to LVMH and see that you can sell a lot of expensive stuff to people. And in fact, if the revenue gets big enough, that ratio, again, that trade-off, and it is a trade-off, can be really, really advantageous and can actually create you know, brand value in a unique way and all these other things, right? But it's not so obvious. And specifically for new entrepreneurial brands in D2C specifically, this can be a real challenge. Because there's this question of like, who is going to buy your product? What is the audience ultimately for your product? Can you convert enough people at that AOV to make that work? I've been thinking recently about the question of why people, when they hire in their businesses, don't hire in the Philippines with my friends at More Staffing. When you hear these ads that I do with them, why would you add talent to your team and not look in the Philippines? I think there's three reasons people potentially do it. One, they're worried about the quality of work. That is the last thing you have to worry about. There is a deep infrastructure of e-commerce professionals in the Philippines across all parts of the business who are really good and more staffing is incredible at helping you find those employees and adding them to your team. They also do all kinds of work to onboard, coach, train those employees to working with your business and make sure that they're in good shape to, to get into whatever you are working on. And they'll even give you a guarantee if the employee doesn't work out on a quality level or anything like that, within a year, if you don't retain them for within a year, 
they will ultimately give you uh, go through the work of finding you a replacement employee for no additional cost. So on a quality level, it's just simply not really an issue. There are great and talented people in the Philippines. I think people number two are worried about English speaking. And is that going to be an issue in the Philippines? The vast majority of people, especially on the sort of millennial and younger age groups, generations are learning English growing up or are very, very good in English. I have personally worked with Filipino employees in multiple businesses now. I've never seen English speaking actually create an issue. Okay. And so that is just really not really a problem. And number three, I think some people are worried about the time zone issue. And while that can be understandable, many employees are willing to work graveyard shifts if that's the case in your business. Or I've actually seen in my own business when I've worked with Filipino employees that one of the advantages has been to pass work off at different times. And when I pass off that work and, and wake up in the next morning, I will actually see that be done and I can review it, etc. So there's a natural rhythm instead of all the overlap and time wasted on slacks and all those things of getting work done, giving feedback and going from there. So that in all told, I think uh, there's not really a great reason at this point for you to not consider working with uh, employees from the Philippines. And my friends at More Staffing are the people to do it. Go to morenow.co to get a conversation started. Or if you just want to learn a little bit more about this, go check out my interview with Lara, the, the CEO of More Staffing. She's worked in US-based e-commerce businesses for a long time. Uh, and Lara can tell you what it is really like from the Filipino side of that so you can understand it a little better. Go to morenow.co, add incredible talent to your business today. Number four, this is the really hidden one. And it's if you are driving value with paid media, there is another problem, which is slow purchase accumulation. And this is something I think people really don't think about. Meta and Google both need data to optimize. And so if you are generating less purchases and you don't have tons of money to throw around to spend, it is really, really hard. I mean, I've seen businesses that are like spending $1,000 a day and they're generating like four purchases in a day. Well, if you have to get 50 purchases per week to get out of the learning phase in meta ads, right? Or Google ads, I've heard like five purchases per day, you know, begins to allow you to optimize or something like that. Like there's this question to me of how much money you are able to spend while getting data very slowly, while sample sizes of purchases build very, very slowly. If that is the case, that you, you're you building a slow amount of purchases, you, you might not end, exit the learning phase very fast, even if you're spending a decent amount of money. You might get data really, really slowly, which will tell Meta very slowly what ads are working. Now, I think Meta is really good at figuring this out. I think Google's very good at figuring this kind of thing out. But it can be a real problem. Whereas think about the other side. Like when I'm working on a deodorant brand or something, I can I get a bunch of purchases every day pretty fast, even without very much budget. And that allows me to optimize and make decisions quicker and if there's no marginal difference, then it's, it doesn't really matter to me. So that's, I think, actually a huge challenge. And that is a bigger challenge the larger the AOV is. Again, go back to my furniture brand example. In that case, it's really hard for them to get purchase data. I mean, you know, generating $100,000 is a $3,000 average order value is 33 purchases. Like that is really, really tough. So that makes, that makes the optimization game a whole lot harder as your AOV gets bigger. Okay. All right. So those are some disadvantages of AOV. This is why it's not quite clear. Let me tell you why I think it is still ultimately a good thing to raise your AOV, of course, and give you a couple of reasons why. The first is more customer per or more revenue per customer can be great, assuming that assuming the total just market is what we said. And this is just to kind of bring back around the obvious point. If you can generate more revenue per customer, it can be really, really good. And this is where like a bundling strategy makes a ton of sense. If you like post-purchase upsells as a product make a ton of sense here as well. If you can convert customers and with no risk to you at all, you can create an additional offer that puts additional value on the order without any risk of losing the conversion, which is what the whole concept of a post-purchase upsell is, right? That's really good. Uh, that's just additional dollars in your pocket on a customer that you're going to convert anyway. Some customers are going to do that. You reduce the conversion rate risk, you reduce the, the negative effect there, and it creates a, a really good uh, outcome. So that's that's really obvious, okay? But secondly, it is often the case, I, I said that AOV and conversion rate are inversely correlated. That's true, but it's not necessarily the case that they are linearly correlated. What I mean is, it's not necessarily the case that they go up and down at the exact same rates. It may be the case, and in fact, it may be the case that conversion rate goes down faster than your AOV goes up. So, you, so you'd have kind of this effect, right? Something like that. If conversion rate 
goes down much faster than your AOV. And that's the thing people are worried about with raising their price, by the way. They'd say, it's great to raise my price, but if my conversion rate tanks too much in the process, then it's actually a loss, even though I get more money per customer, because now I've not converted enough customers at that price. So that's the challenge, is the trade-off on those two things, and is this a linear trade-off? Now, here's the thing, though. A lot of times, the actual trade-off, it's actually non-linear in the other direction. Conversion rate goes down as AOV goes up, but non-linearly, and AOV will outpace the decrease in conversion rate. So your AOV goes way up, your conversion rate comes down some, but ultimately, it drives up what you might say is like revenue per click. So the total value you get per click is actually higher, even if your conversion rate goes down, and your revenue per click is just conversion rate times AOV, okay? So if your AOV outpaces, going up outpaces your conversion rate going down, it's a really big win because that makes every click you get more valuable. And that means that you can probably spend more money or take more profit per click, et cetera. And that's the thing to really watch out for. Are you able essentially to provide enough additional value to your customer that they will go up an AOV faster than, they will, than you will lose customers based on the price uh, drop off, the price point drop off? If you can do that, then AOV is definitely a win and probably a marginal win. And this leads to the last point here. And this is the thing that I think is uh, the easiest to overlook on this side. And it is this. In D2C, shipping is a huge, and fulfillment are a huge part of the central costs of the business model. And if you can increase your AOV without increasing your shipping, commensurate with that, and most times you can, right? Then you get a marginal efficiency on AOV. And that's really, really valuable. What I mean is, let's say it costs $5 to ship your product right now. And if you get another item into that package, you raise your AOV by, let's say you have a hundred dollar, well, let's, let's do it like this. Let's say you have a $50 order AOV right now, and it costs you five bucks to ship it. Okay. Whether or not you're charging for shipping, that five bucks is there. And we could talk about, you know, how you charge for shipping and free shipping is kind of its own question mark. And there's trade-offs with that with every brand as well. I don't want to get into that. So let's just assume $50 is how much money you collect. $5 is how much money you give in shipping. Okay. If you raise that shipping cost from $5 to $6, so a 20% increase, when at the same time as you raise your AOV from $50 to $65, now your shipping has gotten uh, smaller as a percentage of revenue. And that's usually how it works. The first item you put in your package is the most expensive to ship. Adding a second item to that package does not go up at the same rate in cost as that first item does. And so there's a major value on getting a second item in there for that reason, that the shipping gets smaller. Further, you're probably paying a flat processing fee to your 3PL that also gets amortized across more dollars in revenue. So if I'm paying $2 in processing fees, right? You may have pick and pack separate from that or whatever, but if I'm paying $2 in processing fees and I go from $50 to $75 or $50 to $70 or whatever, right? In my AOV, that $2 gets smaller as a percentage and I've opened up some margin just like that. That's a really big advantage as well. So those things can really matter. Now, this is where if you can, if you can make a big AOV jump you can make a big AOV jump while keeping those other things exactly the same, there is a huge marginal efficiency to be gained there. And so I'm working with a client right now whose AOV looks like it's going to go up to the tune of 40% and the cost of shipping it, fulfillment, pick and pack, and gross margin on the product will all be exactly the same as they were before. If that is the case, I mean, that is a huge win because now I can spend more money in CAC, increase contribution margin, and, and if I can do that while also raising my conversion rate, it looks like we might be able to at this point, then that's a massive win in the business. And I'll tell you exactly what accomplished that in this case. And this is the real thing to target here. The client worked for well over a year on building their product to provide a ton more value to the customer and launched it. And it looks like that's going to really, really work. That customers are responding to it really positively. And therefore, they're going to be able to get more margin on that product or the product people like more more dollars per, per customer. Now look, the conversion rate definitely went down. By adding that much AOV, it definitely left some people on the table. But there's enough margin to make up for it and plenty of TAM still, so it can, it can ultimately work itself out. Now, of course, you've also heard plenty of cases. Oh, by the way, that effect is especially significant on a low AOV product. If you can go from like 25 or 30 bucks to 40 bucks, that $5 in shipping, it's really hard to get shipping much lower than five bucks, you know, unless you have a very lightweight item. That $5 in shipping, you know, from $25 to 30 to $35 goes from being 20% of the cost of the product to what's, you know, five over 35. Let's quick math, Andrew, five over 35. It goes to 14%, 14% of the 
product value. Now, again, this may change depending on how you're handling shipping and charging for shipping, but you get the idea. There's a massive, massive, that's 10 points of margin that you just got back right there by going from 25 to 35. So at those lower levels in particular, those shipping costs and fulfillment costs look very, very large relative to the total margin of the, of the product and relative to the total contribution margin. So that can be a really, really big win. And that's the place where you'd probably be trying really hard to get that AOV up because in that respect, you just don't want to be too low. But you get the idea. Now, this all points to one thing. And the scenario that I gave you, and, and by the way, there's plenty of scenarios where people are actively trying to lower their AOV because of the conversion rate issue. I think of supply razors here. I had an interview with Patrick Cadu recently, talked to him about that. I remember when he did this, I was actually pushing him to go up in AOV and he was already at like 80 bucks and 100 bucks or something for his products. And he was trying to get the product down because he thought he was leaving too much total adjustable market on the table. And he just thought, I'm, if I'm charging $100 for a, for a razor that doesn't have any technology in it or anything like that, just a single edge razor, there's just gonna be too many people who I cannot get to come into my and buy my product. And so how can I create enough margin to where I can get the, some version of this at least down 50 bucks and create a $50 version that will attract a larger base? And look, he had a great exit. It worked out great for him. He purposefully went to lower his AOV because of the total adjustable market issue. He was concerned about that particular issue. So there can be a value in doing that. And that's where you have to look in your business to see which one is best for you. Okay, in all of this, one of the implications here is that pricing really is a very big lever. Because if you can raise your AOV without hurting your conversion rate, if you can do that by just increasing the price, like it's just a massive margin win and it's a CAC win and all those things. And so it's really worth considering. Pricing is something people feel like is absolutely stuck in their business and they just have to keep it exactly where it is or they have a customer revolt. They, they will not. You will not have a customer revolt. I've never seen a customer revolt based on pricing. It's not going to happen. So you can test this more than you think and it's not going to create some wild problem in your business. And if you can add dollars on top, so you increase your AOV without any cost to these other things, this can be really, really good. And it can create all kinds of marginal efficiency in your business in a really valuable way. People pick their price out of nowhere. They have no reason why they picked their price. Really, they just have some sense of what it should be. And so it's really worth testing and playing with your price to see if you can get some additional value there. But in the end, AOV, as I said, is more complicated than it looks. There are lots of reasons to go increase your AOV and work on that. There are reasons to decrease your AOV and work on that. Don't believe anybody who says it's that simple. Instead, look at the contribution margin being generated by the total system that you've created. Add as much value as you can to the customer. And that's the path to profit with AOV. All right. Thanks so much for watching this episode or listening to this episode of the show, whichever was the case. Go check out my interview with Brian Porter on the approach from Simple Modern if you want a conversation that gets around some of these issues as well. That is in the show notes. As I mentioned on the show today, my sponsor is, as always, my friends at More Staffing. Virtual assistants can be helpful. Virtual professionals can transform your business. Go hire experienced, incredible e-commerce professionals from the Philippines in your business at morenow.co. Link, of course, there is in the show notes as well. Uh, if you would like to listen to any of my old podcasts, they are available everywhere that fine podcasts are found, right? Spotify, Apple, etc. And a good portion of my catalog is on YouTube. So if you're listening to this, you can go check me out there as well. And I'm always grateful if you will share the show with somebody who would like it, if you'll rate it, if you'll review it, etc. Next week on the show, Nate Lagos, excellent growth marketer who is talking about some success they've seen at Original Grain. He walked through a bunch of different stuff that has worked for them in real, tangible, applicable detail. You're going to like that show as well. And as always, you can follow me on Twitter at Andrew J. Ferris and email me at podcast at ajfgrowth.com and subscribe to the show to get that interview with Nate. Hear from me, talk to me, interact with me in any way that can be helpful to you. You get the idea. You know where to find me. I'll see you next time. And I pray it all. I know the script with my eyes closed.